Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. Pandemic, policies, parking, protests. It's just business as usual for our next guest, Mitch O'Farrell from Council District 13. I am obviously being incredibly facetious when I say that. It has been nothing but business as unusual. So let's begin with some of the current topics. Um, actually, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protest, you and Council Member Curran Price introduced a motion requesting a policy for moving, renaming buildings, streets, and perhaps even removing art that may be deemed offensive by certain communities. What prompted that decision? And are you thinking of anything in particular, or was it just kind of in general looking for a plan? So th first of all, thanks for having me on your show again, Marie. It's always a pleasure, uh, even in these incredibly difficult times that everyone is facing. Um, so in regard to the statues, uh, back in 2017, uh, I led the effort to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. One of the consequences of that was to lobby the county to remove the Columbus statue in Grand Park. There is a process that exists in the county to remove controversial symbols in the, uh, for public display. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, in an act of civil disobedience, the Junipero Serra uh, statue was removed from El Pueblo. Uh, and so that was toppled from its pedestal spontaneously by a group of activists. And that's on city property. But the city has no process for deaccessioning um, these works of art or sculptures or something that is on the public right of way that is controversial. And Junipero Serra, Christopher Columbus, the Confederate uh, soldiers, etc. cetera, uh, are very controversial for good reason. And so the city doesn't have a, a policy, so we want to establish one. This is a moment of reckoning across the country. Uh, the word is out. <laughs> uh, the Confederacy, they fought to protect the institution of slavery. Christopher Columbus was responsible for setting in motion a genocide of the entire Western Hemisphere that Native Americans and indigenous peoples live with to this day. So there are plenty of symbols that represent oppression and slavery and genocide and um, all sorts of problems. Um, and so we need a process to have a reckoning on what that means on city property. And so Mr. Price and I co-introduced the motion so we could establish a process for the city, not unlike the process that the county already has. So forgive my naivete in this regard. When you say you're introducing a process, would that then offer an opportunity for people to voice their feelings and opinions and perhaps uh, might even argue against um, the removal of some of these things and then a decision made by whom? Exactly. So, so this way we have a complete, a complete transparent public forum for these types of discussions. When we removed the Columbus statue in Grand Park, it involved the county uh, art uh, commission. It involved the commission, uh, the Indian Native American uh, Commission, which is the county and city commission. And then it involved uh, public, uh, you know, public hearings. So uh, we don't have any such uh, format for that. We want to make sure that we can proceed in a manner that is fair, open, transparent, and then addresses trauma and harm uh, that these controversial uh, symbols represent, especially if they're put in a place of reverence. We've seen it across the country. Statues of the Confederacy are coming down. They're either getting torn down or they're coming down because the government supports their removal. And so it's time that we establish a process. These are different times. It's a different world than just three months ago, than, than one month ago, two months ago. And with this knowledge out there on, that everyone has access to now, there's just no denying the historical record on what some of these historical figures were responsible for. And in the case of Junipero Serra, uh, in terms of the subjugation of a California indigenous people through the Spanish mission system, uh, his record is well known uh, in the indigenous community. So that needs to be addressed. And we, we need to step up as leaders and make sure that there is a forum and a format to address this issue. Because there is nuance here, because um, we're not only just talking about works of art, we're also, ta or uh, statues, et cetera, and public places, but we're talking about street names and perhaps buildings. So where's the line? Um, it has to be uh, 
city owned? It has to be city responsible? I right. mean, is there any kind of... It could be a city building or anything in the public right of way. Okay. For example, I live in Glassell Park. There's a Verdugo Road, right? Well, Verdugo was a corporal in the Spanish army who hunted Native Americans for sport to the death. But yet we have a major uh, artery named after him in Glassell Park where I live. We need to, we need to have a reckoning uh, with all of these issues. Um, because symbolism is important. If we're to dismantle racism wherever it exists, that also means dismantling the symbols that are uh, held in some form of reverence in the greater public sphere. And, and that has to be addressed. If we're really gonna go after this and attack it fundamentally, then we need to take a look at what we put on public display as well. Well, and there needs to be education because I guarantee that I'm gonna say that myself included, just even the, I, who would have ever thought when you say the word Verdugo that there was that history attached to right. it. So that's very, it's, I could ask a lot of questions about this, but we have so many things that we need to talk about. Um, uh, there was a big mural uh, during Gay Pride that was put out, All Black Lives Matter. Um, is it staying? Did it stay? Where is it going? What's happening with it? So I received an email from the executive director of Trailer Park, uh, and, and uh, they do film trailers in the industry, and they're right there on Hollywood Boulevard. And he had this idea in advance of this unity march that was to take place, and it took a place uh, two weeks ago Sunday. 48 hours in advance, I got this email from him, less than 48 hours, and he said, I have this, this idea, Trailer Park would like to do this if you feel that it would be appropriate. I thought it was a great idea off the bat, but we wanted to run it by the organizers of the actual march. And that is the, uh, the uh, Black LGBTQIA plus uh, action committee. And so we ran it by the organizers, they loved the idea, and within a day, we were putting it on the pavement, painting it. Now, that was done really quick. The street is not vacated, so this installation cannot stay. Uh, that would require a whole entire process. Uh, but it's there for now, temporarily, but we are in the midst of deciding on a permanent presence because history was made two weeks ago Sunday with the All Black Lives Matter March. Over 40,000 people participated. Safely. Safely. Safely, there wasn't a single incident uh, in the heart of where the very first gay pride parade was held. So we made history again. We now need to find a permanent way to honor that history. And that's what we're doing now before uh, this temporary installation is removed. By the way, how do you feel about that? Because last time we spoke, it was important a point in time in which we were all safer at home and all of the Pride events were going to be virtual. And then there was a loosening of, uh, of the restrictions and so the parade actually happened. How was that for you? It was great. I participated. Uh, I marched. I, I was there. Uh, it was impossible to fully socially distance six feet apart, but uh, I saw very few people not wearing protection. Um, I was masked up, as was everyone that I was around. It was a very meaningful, um, important, spiritually uplifting event. Um, and it's, it's so important that the, the black LGBTQ community have a voice. Uh, with the original unrest back in 1969 at Stonewall, it was a black trans woman who was one of the key leaders of the, uh, of the protest at Stonewall. Uh, so we, we have to keep, you know, as a reminder that our movement was born of diversity and now it's, it's the continued diversity, which also sort of teaches a lesson to the greater society that in the LGBTQ community, we really know how to work together uh, because there's one common bond that holds us together and all of us are considered other than. Mm -hmm. And so that otherness is what holds us together and I think enables us to look past uh, the, the differences uh, of skin, excuse me, skin color, et cetera. Uh, so I think that's the, uh, the element that we add to this conversation. Wow. Well, along with um, what's been going on and we were 
you know, our restrictions were loosened up a little bit, but unfortunately, you know, there's somewhat of a increase in the COVID cases in Los Angeles, which means we need to sort of back up a little bit in order to be able to go forward in a positive way in the future. And one of those things that Nguyen wanted to make sure went forward was the, um, the mitigating the problem of people staying home and getting parking tickets. So right. you got that uh, relaxed enforcement extended. Mm -hmm. Was that a big fight, a little fight, or was everybody right on board with you and understood it completely? My team, my field team, they are so on their game. And over the weekend, when it was announced that DOT was going to put the parking enforcement back in full force on July 6th, they started getting calls. Uh, people were anxious about it. Uh, and right around that time, we were starting to roll back our reopening because of the COVID cases have been increasing severely. Bars were closed again. So I thought more people are gonna stay home again. Um, the council isn't meeting we're on recess. I mean, I'm working full time and a lot of my colleagues are so, but the council isn't actually meeting right now. So I thought, well, this is gonna happen while the council's in recess. So we need an emergency extension of the lifting of the restrictions. And so that's what we're doing. Uh, and they'll be in place until the end of July. The last thing that people need is to get, you know, an $82 parking ticket uh, right now, especially if they're staying home and not able to work. Um, so it's just one thing that we can do. I know this from personal experience. I have a neighbor who parks his car right in front of my house and he's there for several days because he's not working right now. I would hate to think that he's gonna get a ticket and he's my next door neighbor. And so I think you can multiply that times 250,000 <laughs> of the folks that I represent. And that's gonna play out in, in a lot of the neighborhoods. So it's something that we can do to at least give folks a little bit of a, a break uh, and they don't have to worry about a parking ticket. Is it specific to your district? I mean, or were, were you met with you know, support from all the other, other districts as well? I knew it was a winner when my team said, can you do something? And my chief of staff said, well, let's, let's do a rule 23 because this is an emergency. And it was, I made the findings and it passed unanimously uh, amongst my colleagues. So it was a no brainer. And there are some exceptions to that rule. I know that metered parking is still metered parking. Right. And you have to- Red curb, et cetera. Right. But this gives a, a great relief uh, for the most part. I don't know about you, but I've gotten plenty of street sweeping tickets in the past because it was my fault. Um, but we can give folks a break right now uh, who, who may be stuck at home for five, six days in a row. And sweepers still out? And be safer that way. Yeah, the sweepers are still going out, but they'll go around the cars. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> See, there's a solution to everything. Right. You just have to be flexible. Um, but unfortunately, because of the fact that we are um, needing to take these uh, proactive actions to not spread the virus, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people still are unable to go back to work. A lot of people are unable to pay their rent. Uh, it, so you are a strong proponent of the HEROES Act because there are restrictions and limitations what can be done on a local level. You really need support from a national perspective. We do. We've done so much to help renters uh, who are uh, living with the consequences of COVID, either because they're unemployed or partially employed now, especially in the service industry. Um, we have effectuated a $100 million subsidy for renters um, that will be uh, deciding uh, soon. That's gonna help about 50,000 households in Los Angeles, um, but we need much more. At the local level, we don't control lending or banking. That's a federal uh, level uh, issue. Um, there are state issues that supersede what we can do locally. So we need help from the state and the feds. The HEROES Act has in it a provision for $180 billion with a B for relief for renters, mortgage holders, and small businesses. Uh, and I, I have to sh give a shout out to Maxine Waters because the renter and mortgage relief was something that she championed in the HEROES Act bill. Um, and it's roughly $100 billion for rent and mortgage relief, which is exactly what we're doing here in Los Angeles with our $100 million grant. I'm doing an extra $1 million in my district for renters, um, and that's gonna help a little bit. So when, when we can work locally and at the federal level together, we're talking about real assistance. This will be the largest federal relief bill in US history, larger than the CARES Act, which was $2.1 trillion, which passed in late March. Um, but here we are all these months later, 
COVID. The first wave is still with us and spiking. So it's going to be with us for a while. And I think that uh, both parties are going to be motivated to do something very real. It's affecting red, blue states. It doesn't matter what the, you know, your political stripe is. And so we have leaders in cities that are Republicans and Democrats really pushing hard for this level of relief for mortgage holders and renters. Well, because it's a domino, um, you know, if people aren't paying the rent, I mean, as much as we want the renters to end up in a scenario in which they're safe and they can stay at home if they're having problems, people own those properties. Mm -hmm. And they're beginning, I mean, it was one point in which they had to deal with it for three months, but now to consistently go with that, it's not just huge major corporations that own these, um, these properties, it's mom and pops, it's small people who are not getting they're, and they still have to pay their mortgage on these properties and that That's they're right. not receiving rental income from. That's right. And it's mostly smaller mom and pop and family owned uh, businesses that own most of the apartment buildings in Los Angeles. But guess what will happen if they go into foreclosure or, or file for bankruptcy? They'll get gobbled up by hedge funds and corporations. And then we'll lose that neighborhood touch because a corporation is this you know entity that we don't know. It's a faceless you know, well-funded entity that isn't necessarily going to care about what happens on the ground. They're not necessarily going to even care. They're going to have that personal contact with their own renters. But the mom and pops that we know don't want their, to lose their renters that they have. Um, so we need, to, we need to make sure that their buildings don't go into foreclosure and get gobbled up by the hedge funds. And we need to make sure that renters stay there uh, and uh, we can put them on a, a strong financial footing during and after COVID comes to an end at some point. So we have to think short term and long term, and we can do that at, at both at the same time, but we can never relent. We're going to have to all contact our senators and our co congressional representatives to make sure that they push hard for the HEROES Act. And we can do that across party lines. I mean, if you're, if you live in Los Angeles and you have someone who's you know a, a co-signer of the HEROES Act, then contact someone who's on the fence in a different state who's going to help decide our fate as well. What's People need to get active on this. What's the timeline on it, speaking of being, taking uh, I understand that it's going to be heard this month in Congress. Uh, the House of Representatives already passed their version, so we'll see if the Senate takes action and if it gets reconciled. I, I feel that it must. Uh, can you imagine what the fallout will be across the country? Uh, if something isn't created to keep people housed and keep their mortgages sound uh, going into November with, with coronavirus being the way it is and unemployment being at record levels. Um, so we have to, we can't take it for granted that something is going to happen, but I'm eternally optimistic about it, especially if, if we as constituents and everyday people do our job and lobby uh, folks in Congress. With the stimulus uh, package, those came out pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. with this uh, HEROES Act, do we feel that you know the money will be available as quickly if in fact it does pass? Well, here's what needs to happen. The HEROES Act needs to pass and get signed into law by the president. Right. They also need to extend unemployment. And that needs to happen at the state level and at the federal level because that runs out at the end of July. So that's going to put people in another bind. So. The state needs to act in extending uh, our unemployment insurance. Um, and, and certainly the federal unemployment insurance runs out in July. The state, I'm not so sure actually. But uh, so the feds, Congress is going to have to extend unemployment. That's that $600 a week. So that needs to happen. And I think members of both houses have a, a basic understanding that their constituents are really gonna need that. The spikes now are in the states that are, have traditionally been red states. So. You know, as cliche as it sounds, we literally are all in this together. It's time to put everything aside and give a relief, a bailout for everyday Americans, not big corporations, but everyday people who are trying to stay housed and keep their mortgages sound. Okay. So along those lines of actually making sure that uh, we're doing it all together and we're uh, helping each other, you have been a proponent of, as far as mask wearing, mm -hmm. education over enforcement. Now mm -hmm. that was actually, you know, a few weeks ago. Right. Has your stand changed? Do you feel now, because I know the mayor of Santa Monica said, first it was education, then it was encouragement, now it's enforcement. 
How are you feeling? Are you still in education or do you think we need to move into enforcement? We may very well go into enforcement, but we also have to take a look at the realities. We must have all of our first responders always wearing a mask as well. I don't always see that. So we're going to have to have everyone wear masks. We certainly can't have someone enforcing someone wearing a mask in public if they themselves are not wearing a mask. Um, so believe me, I take a look at those numbers every day as well. Everything's fluid, right? Um, I also don't want unintended consequences. There's a gentleman who walks in my neighborhood and I certainly see him carrying his mask, but he doesn't always have it on. If he's walking all alone and he's not around anyone else, does he absolutely need to have his mask on in public? So it's not as easy as enforce or not. Where will you enforce? When will you enforce? Um, but when it comes right down to it, if these cases keep climbing and we have to go in that direction, I'm going to be open to it. Again, <laughs> it's a moving target. Yes. It's very important. But one of the things that was uh, obviously taken into consideration when the pandemic um, was realized and hit hard was the unhoused. Mm -hmm. And some things were put into place that seemed to help mitigate the problem. Um, how does it stand and what do you feel needs to be continued and or enhanced? Because that's the mo that is an incredibly vulnerable population. Lots of moving parts in relation to people experiencing homelessness. So we did Project Room Key. I think that was about 3,600 um, rooms for people experiencing homelessness. No, that was, that, the 3600 was the recreation centers. We were able to house temporarily that many people. Project Room Key was a few, yeah, the hotels, a few more than that. Um, now, in, in the meantime, just last week on council, we approved an additional 1,100 uh, beds of a bridge home uh, that we'll have in place by the end of this month. So that puts a bridge home, our city shelters, at over 2,100 beds. Um, on top of that, we have, within three years, we have about 700 units of permanent supportive housing opening up in the 13th district alone. By 2023, 2024, we're gonna have about 10,000 units of permanent housing under the HHH program. And then I'm working on purchasing a hotel in Hollywood that will be permanent housing for people experiencing homelessness. And then we authorized leasing another hotel in my district. We authorized that last week in the council as well. So what I'm getting at is gonna, it's gonna take all sorts of avenues we can go down to get people housed permanently, temporarily. We're talking about um, you know, uh, other forms of temporary shelter. Um, and it all needs to lead into permanent housing in some form or fashion. Um, and so I'm also hopeful that we'll be receiving additional funds from the state especially when we look at Miguel San, uh, Santiago's bill that I helped work on, which is the $2 billion annually for 10 years to address homelessness across the state of California. That has to be approved in a Senate committee and then signed by the governor. That's going to be critical to us. And uh, that's something else that we can all get involved in. And that is push the governor to sign that bill once it gets on his desk, because I do believe it is going to end up on his desk. It passed the assembly overwhelmingly. Uh, and I don't have the bill number in my head right now, but um, it's Assembly Member uh, Miguel Santiago's bill. And we helped, my office helped craft uh, some of the definitions so that LA would get its fair share. It's a complex scenario, and I don't even pretend to, you know, to act as if I have any, but just, just the plan of getting someone off you know, uh, the streets into um, a safe and secure environment. How do you solicit somebody from A to B, and then once they're in this safe and secure environment, how do you get them stable enough to be able to exist without the support of the city and the state? I mean, that seems to be, it has to be not just one thing, it has to be multiple things that are built upon each other mm -hmm. in order for it to be successful. Right. So is all that incorporated in all of these plans and these purchases and these bills? That's a great question. It is, that's called the continuum of care. And once we can convince someone to come indoors, that's the very biggest obstacle of all. Yeah, because, seems to have been a big one. right, so once we get someone inside and then they, they have the resources that they're surrounded by to, to keep them, get them stabilized, 
uh, and then we get them on a track for a, a permanent home, then we're well on our way. Uh, and the, the numbers uh, get better and better the longer someone stays housed temporarily because they have the support system they get to know, um, they get stabilized, and then they're on a pathway to a permanent housing. It, it all depends on the services they get though, right? So we definitely need clinical services that include physical health, uh, mental, psychological uh, well-being, and addiction uh, treatment. We've got to have all of that because um, it, between addiction issues and mental health issues, um, that makes up a significant portion of people experiencing homelessness. It, by some studies, up to three quarters of all individuals ex experiencing homelessness. So there are no easy answers. But if we don't have the places for someone to dwell indoors, then we're just you know, we're just talking out of thin air. We've actually got to have the housing stock, the temporary housing stock and the permanent housing stock to get people indoors permanently because once we can reel them in and earn their trust, then the likelihood of them staying uh, on a track to be successful in life or be stabilized um, works in their favor. And that's, that's, that's the whole approach. Is workforce training involved in there as yes, well? Yes, oftentimes. We'll hold job fairs. Uh, they'll have personal caseworkers who will connect them with employment opportunities. We definitely have success stories where someone was literally living on a tent or in a tent on a sidewalk somewhere. Down on their luck, they might have had a physical setback, ended up homeless, lost everything. They get into a bridge shelter, they get a job, they end up in permanent housing and they're back on track in life. And they may not even stay in a permanent supportive housing situation. They may move on to an affordable or a market rate house, uh, housing situation eventually and then make room for someone else who is on their same journey that they were on. We don't have a lot of time left, but okay. I do want to ask you because, you know, you are um, responsible for the Hollywood area and of course we were talking before we started um, rolling the cameras about theater. Mm -hmm. um, optimistic, hopeful, obviously you're a theater lover, I'm a huge theater lover, yeah. a lot of tragedy uh, recently yes. with some of our beloved performers. Mm -hmm. um, how are you feeling about the future of theater, yeah. small theater, large theater, etc.? So uh, I'm on a mission to make sure that our small theaters survive. Um, we are helping our small theater community with arts funding that exists in our discretionary pot through the cultural affairs department. I'm focused on keeping our small theaters alive through this and we're working with them as, as closely as we possibly can. Uh, beyond that, some of the larger theaters actually have a, a wider support system. They qualify for various grants, even through the CARES Act. Um, and then we're also inviting anyone, small theater companies, et cetera, uh, to apply for my $1 million fund for small businesses. I've established another fund through discretionary priorities. Uh, and so we're contacting uh, our theater community as well to apply for, for funding, $5,000 grants that we're offering uh, in our million dollar fund, just to help people, people stay afloat. And I'm hope, hopeful that Small theaters will do you know, programming even online, Zoom performances, et cetera. It's a new world. We have to think creative, creatively in new ways. Uh, and I want everyone to understand that my office is here to help because we're all on this adventure that none of us intended on being on, but we're on it and we've got to make the most of it somehow. Uh, and that's, that's why I'm here. And if someone wants to reach out and find out about what the office is doing and what the different opportunities are and what uh, the different policies that are being put into place, what's the best way? Give us a call or log on to my website, subscribe to my e-newsletter. Uh, they can call 213-473-7013 or cd13.com uh, and just contact us uh, and, and learn about the programs that we're offering. Well, I really appreciate all of this information. Um, hopefully, next time we chat, it'll be because something is open, something is launched, and we're going to be celebrating something. But congratulations on uh, keeping things alive and going well in your district. Thanks, Maria. I appreciate that. We're here to we're here to keep things going. That's that's uh, that's why I'm that's why I'm doing this job. Okay. Well, <laughs> you take care, Mitch. Thank you. And that's a wrap on this edition of LA Currents.